session is Build Back Better with the Migrate API. Obviously, I came up with that title a while ago. Um, I put the slides together, but this is the first chance I've, I've had to give this talk. Um, I'm Benji Fisher. You know where you are and what day it is. I just did that. So, a little about me. Um, I'm Benji Fisher on most of the social media that I use. Um, which is primarily Drupal.org, but, but some other things. And I, I was slow to sign up on Twitter, so I had to insert my favorite number, 17, uh, in order to, because someone else had already gotten the username Benji Fisher. Um, that's my avatar, it's a yellow pig. Um, I, I figure when I come to a conference, I might run into people who've interacted with me on Drupal.org or on Twitter and might recognize my avatar but not recognize me. So I wear the hat, which is also a yellow pig. And if you Google yellow pig 17, um, you will easily find out uh, where, where it comes from. Um, for the past uh, two years and a little bit, I've been one of the maintainers of the migration system in Drupal core, in other words, the migrate API. Um, for several years, I've been a member of the usability group, and I currently run the weekly usability meetings on Zoom. And recently, um, about three months ago, I was added to the Drupal security team as a provisional member. So, um, thank you. I, I, I'm just hoping that in the not too distant future, I'll be able to erase provisional from, uh, from my slides, but not yet. I work for a company called Fruition. Uh, our, our slogan is build, grow, and protect. Um, I build websites in Drupal, but that's only part of what the company does. We also do digital marketing and SEO. We'll write your blog posts for you. Um, and it's the first company I've ever worked for that does its own hosting. So uh, fruition.net if you want to check us out. Um, if you'd like to follow along at your own pace, all of my slide decks are at slides.benjifisher.info. Um, if I were registering the domain now, I would look for .io, but I got this several years ago, um, so it's .info. Um, and if you go there, you'll see that uh, I'm not a designer, that uh, their HTML list could use a, a little bit of style. So, this is what I plan to talk about in the session, the introduction, we're already started. Um, I want to talk about the general question of bringing data into Drupal, and I want to talk enough about how the Migrate API works so that you'll be able to understand what comes later. But really, the meat of the talk is the examples, um, so using editor styles in, um, in migrated content, um, how to structure content that starts out as unstructured, how to update links in body text, and how to update from Drupal 7 media. And then I'll give a little summary at the end. Um, and I, I hope there, there, there will certainly be some technical details in this, and if you're a developer writing migrations, I think, uh, you can learn from this, um, but my, my hope is that if you're willing to just you know, stare off into space for, for those slides, um, this talk will also be useful for people who have a site that they need to get migrated or have a site that they're responsible for. And the important thing for, for those members of the audience is that it can be done, and you don't have to worry too much about the details of how it's done, although I can't resist presenting the details of how it's done. Um, so let me talk a little about bringing data into Drupal, which is what the Migrate API does. Um, so one of the primary uses, but not the only one, is upgrading a site from Drupal 6 or Drupal 7. Um, and the process going from Drupal 6 or Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 plus, currently Drupal 9, soon to be Drupal 10, um, it, it's not really considered an upgrade, it's really a migration. Um, you're building a new site and then you're 
bringing your content into it. Sometimes you're bringing some of the configuration into it uh, before bringing in the content. So I have a Drupal 6 site. I've been paying for extended support, but that's ending in next year. I should know this. Um, so better late than never, I'm going to create a Drupal 9 site with all of my existing content. So question, what tool are you going to use? Here the answer is pretty clear. You're going to use the Migrate API. Um, you might be up upgrading from other systems. You have a WordPress site and you're reaching uh, the limits of what WordPress can, can do well. Um, but you have a lot of content on the site. And how are you going to bring that into Drupal? Um, again, question, what tool are you going to use? And the answer is, again, the Migrate API. Um, this is something people don't necessarily think about with the Migrate API recurring imports or feeds. Um, I have to bring in some content every hour from an Atom feed or XML or JSON or SOAP or, or, or um, spreadsheet files, CSV files. And here, I, I, I guess I should update this slide because the answer isn't really um, clear cut. Um, in Drupal 6 or 7, you probably would have used the feeds module. And I think maybe when I wrote this slide, the feeds module was still not really usable, but it is now. Um, and there, there are use cases for feeds, and there are use cases for the Migrate API. And uh, in fact, we, we had a discussion on, on just this question on Slack a month or two ago. And the people who maintain the feeds module are pr pretty much in agreement with, with me. Um, if you have sort of flat data, um, you have an article with an image and a title and body text and, and maybe term references, um, that's fine. Feeds is great. Use feeds. It will be simpler than using the Migrate API. Um, if you have complex dependency relations, if you have previous and next links on your articles, um, if you're creating um, paragraphs with their own set of fields that are going to be included in the paragraphs, um, the feeds module really isn't suitable for that, and you'll be using the Migrate API. So I've used it for um, importing events, importing articles, importing documentation. Um, and yeah, I, I remember one, one person, at a university client, um, one developer was saying, well, I'm bringing in these events and I ran into this, and he started out using feeds, and I ran into this problem, so I changed it that way, and I had dependencies, and I did this. And he was applying patches and, and doing hard stuff, and I said, stop, you're just digging a hole, stop digging, forget about feeds, use the Migrate API. So, so the complex dependencies are really what's up with this. Um, one thing that you really might not think of for, for the Migrate API is restructuring a live site. Now suppose you built this site a couple of years ago and you have three content types that should really be the same content type with maybe a field to distinguish them. Um, I want to add or remove a field. I want to take um, you know, serialized data or complex data and pick it apart into structured data and, and structured as paragraphs. Um, there, there are several ways of doing this. You might write a custom action and then do it with use bulk operations. You might write um, an implementation of book update or post update. Um, but the Migrate API is useful, and, and again, it, it depends on whether it needs to track old and new entity IDs, whether it needs to keep track of relations between data. So if you had links to this old node and you're changing that node to a different type of node, different content type, you're probably also going to be changing the entity ID, then you need to keep track of the old and new entity IDs to preserve the references. And that's a use case for the Migrate API. Um, if you have complex dependencies, if you can use some of the tools it provides, 
Um, all of those would be arguments for using the Migrate API. And some of the tools it provides are what I'm talking about in the rest of this uh, session. Um, so an introduction to the Migrate API. Again, I just want an overview of how it works so that you can understand the examples better. Um, every migration project has many migrations. Um, each migration will have a single source. It might be an XML file. It might be um, the database. Certainly if you're doing a Drupal 6 or 7 migration into a Drupal 9 site, your source is going to be the database. Um, each one of the migrations in your project is going to create one entity type. You'll have one migration or, or possibly a few migrations that create nodes. You'll have one or a few that create um, taxonomy terms, users, files, media. Um, a, a single XML file, or obviously a single database, could be the source of several different entity types and therefore several different migrations. Um, and just in terms of the scale, a, a, a typical site migration will have dozens of migrations. Um, you know, you start out thinking, oh, I have articles and, and I have blog posts. So it, it's only a couple. And then you start thinking, oh yeah, users and files, and, oh, media, taxonomy. It, it, it adds up and, uh, and, and it's typically dozens. And, and a complex site could be hundreds. Um, each one of those migrations, each migration has a source and it's creating one entity type. Um, each migration has three stages and um, sort of the, the industry standard term, not, not the Drupal centric term, but the industry standard term is extract, transform, and load, ETL. Um, the Drupal terms for these are source plugin for the extract phase and that's where you get data from your source. and um, and, and generate one row per item, per, per entity that you're going to be creating. Um, the transform phase, um, you might have timestamps that have to be con converted to string representations of dates or the other way around, probably the other way around. Um, you might have uh, uh, cleanup you have to do on your text fields. You might have to uh, convert a place name to a latitude and longitude. Um, that's the transformed phase. And every single field or property on your content type is going to have at least one process plugin. That's the Drupal term, process plugin. Yeah, it, it, it might just be the default one, which is copy over this value to that value. But even that is a process plugin. Um, if it's doing any sort of massaging of the data, it could be several process plugins. Um, and then the third stage, load, there's a destination plugin. Um, each migration has one of these because it's creating one entity type. I guess there, there are, almost every migration I've ever done is creating entity types. It could be creating something else. Um, so, so based on that description, which of the three stages do you think is the most fun? Load. Say again? Load. The load, getting the data from your source. Um, in some ways that's the most important because you know, the, the source is where all the cruft is, where all the, all the skeletons are buried, all the mistakes have been made. And one of my mantras for migrations is that the most important part of any migration is understanding the source. Um, but I don't think that's the most fun. <laughs> There's, each migration has one source, each migration has one destination, but it has lots and lots of process plugins, lots of transformations. So that, that's what I consider the most fun part. Um, it's also the part where I think there's the most opportunity for reusing work. Um, if, if you've got a WordPress site and you've got um, a Fox Space Pro database, I've heard people use these words, luckily I've never had to deal with them, and if you've got CSV files, um, then 
you write a source plugin that pulls from each one of those sources, you're not going to be helping each other. Um, and for the destination plugins, well, Drupal already knows about Drupal entities. So that part is already done. That's in the, the Migrate API. Um, but but all, all, all the, the work um, is in transforming things from, from one form to another. So I'm going to talk a lot about the, uh, the transform stage or process plugins. Um, and the basic strategy, the way that process plugins work, is uh, what, what, what's called a filter. And a filter just means that you, you have something that takes an input and produces an output, and you can typically um, put filters together. So some examples that may or may not be familiar to you, um, if you're working on the command line in, in a shell like Bash, you can say git branch dash dash merged, and that will list all of the branches that have already been merged into the branch you're currently on. And then you can pipe that, so you take the output of that and use it as the input for the grep command, and you grep for feature. So now you're finding all branches that's, that include the word feature. So depending on your branch naming conventions, uh, if you're using something like Gitflow, the, these would be the feature branches that you've merged into the main branch. And then, since these branches are all feature branches that have already been removed, these are the ones you want to remove. So then you pipe the results of that to xargs git branch dash d, and that runs git branch delete this branch, git branch delete that branch, and it deletes all of those feature branches that you don't need anymore because they've already been merged. Um, Twig also uses uh, the pipe symbol to take the output of one command and, and give it to the next command. So you have some sort of a list, basically an array. Um, you can pipe it to map of item goes to item pipe lower. Um, every so often I teach a front end developer about the twig map command and they're so happy because the alternatives to using it are, are so annoying. Um, and that just applies the lower function, it lower cases e each item in the list. And then you take the output of that and you pipe it to the join command, so you create one string out of them, comma separated in this example. So again, th this is po possibly familiar examples of filters. It's just the idea that each one does one thing, and the, the power of the system is that you take the output of one filter and you feed it to the next filter. And the process plugins or the transform stage of the migrate API follow this model. They, they work as filters. Um, so core and contrib modules provide filters, which we call process plugins. Most of them have some configuration. And learning how to use them, learning how to combine them into pipelines takes some practice, some experience, um, a lot of experimentation, and that's what makes it fun. So here's an example. Um, so we don't use a pipe symbol. Um, we use YAML to describe our process pipelines. So in, in each migration, we'll have a, a process section um, and for each field on, on the entity we're creating, um, we're going to apply one or more filters. So here I have some formatted text field. I'm going to apply three process plugins. Um, the first one is the callback. I'm going to apply the PHP HTML entities function, and that will escape ampersands and less than and greater than. Um, and then I'm going to take the output of that and give it to the string replace filter. And I'm going to replace things that look like HTML entities for representing spaces, and I'm going to replace them with simple spaces. Um, and then I'm again going to use the callback plugin, um, and I'm going to apply the PHP trim function to remove leading and trailing spaces, but not intermediate spaces in my string. And only the first of these three has a source because the others, the second and third, get their source from the previous one. So the source is the old field that I'm using. 
Um, and then what, one of the, the really cool things that um, the Migrate API provides is DOM processing. So I've, I've given a, a whole talk about this. Um, in fact, you should look up my talk, I think in 2019 at NEDCAMP where I, was, I gave the presentation with Marco Viegas and, uh, uh, and, and we, we talked about how, how, how to use uh, DOM processing and why to use DOM processing and not just process your, your HTML with, with regular expressions. Um, and the way this works is you take some text field like the, the body text of, of your old site um, you apply the DOM uh, process plugin using the, um, the import configuration. So that, that import says take a string and convert it to a PHP DOM document object. And then other plugins do their work on that DOM document object. And then the DOM plugin with the export configuration converts the DOM object back into a string, which you then load into your field. Um, and those intermediate steps where you're working on DOM documents, you're typically going to be selecting elements using XPath expressions. XPath is a topic unto itself, but um, just in simple examples, you can select all links, anchor tags, um, using slash slash A. Um, you can find all links that have a particular class using syntax slash slash a and then bracket class equals external close bracket um, or you can find all links anchor elements that are children of list items that have the navigation class if you're familiar with jQuery and selecting things uh, using uh, jQuery selectors anything you can do Anything you can select in jQuery and more you can do with XPaths, it can get really hairy. Um, so, first example, using editor styles. Um, and this is something I've actually done. I need to import documentation pages from an external system. Um, the external system gives it to me as formatted HTML. But it doesn't look like it's written on my site. It's not using the CSS classes that my site design uses to style the site. So if I just import it as is, it's going to look like crap. It's going to look like plain flat HTML with, with no CSS rules applied. So how can I make it match um, site style guide? Um, and I guess not, not everyone knows this. It, it's, part of configuring a site. Um, when you're setting up your, your text formats, um, you can configure CK Editor, and, and you get to choose um, what's going to show up in the editor interface. So the bottom screenshot there shows someone editing a text field using CK Editor. And in particular, it shows this drop-down list called Styles. And you can apply the plain list style, or the fancy list style, or the neon fancy list style. Where do those come from? They're defined in this admin screen, which is the first screenshot. So when you're configuring the styles, um, you just give, what is it? Um, the format is an HTML element optionally filed by some CSS classes and then a pipe, which is, well, not a pipe, a vertical bar, and then the label you want to appear uh, in the editor interface. So plain list appears in the editor interface, and it's defined by a UL element, an ordered list element, with the class plain dash list. So this is something you have control over, and this is how you can add custom CSS classes um, using CK Editor. So when you're building a site, you have complete control over this and you can configure it differently for each text format. 
So there is a plugin that specifically takes whichever text format you want, looks at the configured styles, and then applies them to the, the HTML that, that, it's, um, that, it, that it's fed. So we, we, we hope that whatever external source you're getting it from, it's not giving you garbage HTML, it's just not your HTML. So it has some structure to it. Um, maybe it has its own classes um, or, or other attributes. But as, as long as you can identify things with XPath expressions, and XPath is pretty expressive, um, you can then apply the given style. So it follows that pattern I was talking about before for using DOM processing. Um, you start off with the, the DOM plugin with import that gives you a DOM document object. Um, then there's this plugin called DOM apply styles. You say, I want to use the format basic HTML. I want to look at the styles configured for that text format. And then wherever you see any unordered list, um, so the XPath is slash slash UL, I'm going to give it the fancy list. So I'm going to attach some CSS class. Um, and then I'll convert it back to a string and put it into my body field. Um, So another example, structuring unstructured content. Um, and this is a somewhat simplified version of uh, an actual project I did. Um, every person page starts with a job title in an H4 tag and a photo in an image tag. Um, how can I move these into separate fields and keep the rest of the text in the body field? Um, and so what I'm talking about is in that HTML snippet before, uh, at, at the bottom. So inside an H4 tag, I have the job title, chief assistant to the assistant chief. Um, then there's an image. It has source and, and alt attributes. Um, and then there's the rest of, of the text, starting maybe with, with a paragraph. Um, I actually ran into this. It was a... Drupal 7 to 9 migration, um, but there was no person content type in the Drupal 7 site. They just had a single page, and they had, in the, using their the, the editor in the body text of this single page, they had this structure and and just a list of people. So, but, but there was some consistency in it, and each one started off. They didn't have enclosing divs. I would have made it easier. But each one started off with an H4 tag, and then an image tag, and then the rest of it. Maybe it wasn't close enough. Um, and I, I had to pick it apart. And I told them, you only have two dozen of these. Get an intern to do copy, paste, copy, paste. You'll probably take as much time of the intern's time as you'll take of my time to develop it. But they said, no, 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 we want it. I said, OK, I'll do the migration. Um, so why would we want to do this? What's the advantage of having the image and the job title in separate fields rather than wrapped in the appropriate HTML tags in the body field? Anyone? Reusability. Yeah. Say again? Reusability. Reusability. I love that word. <laughs> um, yes. Um, can, can you be a little more specific? How could you reuse the, the title and the image? The ability to per repurpose something in multiple locations and restyle it. You can repurpose it in multiple locations and restyle it, sure. So for example, you could have a listing page, yes. and you could have the standalone page for a person, and the listing page will have a small version of, of the image, and probably a different font size for the job title and all that. Um, this is what Drupal does really well, right? Structured content. Um, second part, after getting them into separate fields, is to remove them from the existing body. I hope no one was thinking of hiding them with CSS. Yeah, you can do that, but it just feels wrong, and things that feel wrong tend to lead to problems for further down the line. Um, 
So I won't ask you to answer that question because I don't really want to know the answer. Um, third question, are these people pages coming from a Drupal 7 site, that was my example, or WordPress or an XML feed? And it's a trick question. I don't care. <laughs> because um, we, we have the structure of, of that the Migrate API uses, it separates the, the extract, the transform, and the load, the source, the process, and, and the destination. So what I'm talking about here is all in the, the process plugins, the transform stage. So I don't really care whether it came from an XML feed or an existing Drupal 7 site. Um, so again, there's a process plugin that pulls out something based on an XPath expression. Um, it uses DOM processing again. And the plugin is called DOM underscore select. So again, you have the pattern where you start by applying the, the basic DOM plugin to create a DOM document object. Then you select, use DOM select, you give it an XPath selector, so you find the, the H4 element. Um, there's a limit parameter. I only want one job title per person page, person node. Um, other use cases, I, I might uh, be extracting all of the H4 elements if there's more than one, but here I only want one. Um, then there's a technicality. Um, it returns a sort of nested array, and you want to extract just the first element of that array. Um, and I think I have to scroll here. No, I guess I just left off of this side. Um, at the end, we do the usual. We take our DOM. Oh no, I take it back. I, I, I was right not to put that. Um, I just extracted, I get a string, and I feel, feed that into field job title. So I'm, the, the body field will be handled later. So here I'm not converting the DOM document object back to a text object, I'm just selecting a string from it. Um, getting the photo in a separate field is a little more involved. Um, part of it is the, exactly the same idea. It's just we're using a different XPath selector to select the image rather than the, um, rather than the H4 element. Um, and oh, if, you, if you're reading carefully, slash slash image slash at source, is how you select the source attribute from an image tag. Um, as I said, X, XPath is very, uh, very, very flexible. has has a lot you can do with it. Um, but then once you have that image URL, you have to um, find the file it refers to, and download that file and save it and create a file entity. Probably on a Drupal 9 site, you're going to be using media. So once you have a file entity, you're going to create a media entity. Um, and then finally, you're going to reference either the file directly or re reference the media in the person migration, the migration that creates person nodes. Um, so you'll end up using the migration lookup plugin to get the, uh, the, the file ID or the media ID. Um, so, uh, again, the point is not, not to give you all the details, but, but the important thing is it can be done. And, and the rest of these steps are, are sort of bread and butter migration for people who've, who've done them. Um, and then the final step is I've pulled out the title, I've pulled out the image, or the mugshot, into uh, separate fields. How do I remove them from the body field, and how am I doing for time? Am I over time? Really, I should be wrapping up. Um, so let me finish up this slide. Um, and, and again, there, there's a particular plugin, DOM remove, and based on an XPath, it just strips things out of a DOM document object. So you create the DOM document object, strip out the image, you strip out the H4, convert it back to a string, you've got your body text. Um, update links and body text. I'll just show you the first slide here, what the challenge is. Um, on the old site, about us is node slash six, but on the new site, 
we're not preserving node ID, so it's going to be node slash 136. Um, a lot of the body fields have the text href equals slash node slash six in them. How can you update this? And this exact example is why Marco and I wrote the DOM process plugin several years ago. And I want to give a shout out to Isovera, where we were working at the time, and Pegasystems, which was our client. Um, and they let us donate these, these plugins back to the Migrate Plus module so that other people could use them. Um, updating from Drupal 7, if you have a Drupal 7 site that used the media module, how do you migrate to Drupal 9? And the problem there is that you probably have media tokens in your text fields and you have to deal with them somehow. Um, there's a, a module that makes that easy for you. Um, and there, there's more to the slides. I gave you a link to the slides. Um, feel free to email me about them or look at the slides, but for time I'm going to jump to the conclusion. So again, this is the same uh, outline that I gave at the start, bringing data to Drupal, an introduction to the Migrate API. I got through the first two examples, didn't really have time for the third and fourth examples, and we're doing the conclusion. Um, just some ideas of, of what's next for DOM processing. Maybe DOM document isn't the best solution. Maybe we should be looking at uh, Masterminds HTML5 processing. Um, I'd love to see a source plugin that understands the JSON API format. Um, one thing that I think shouldn't be hard is that we, we should have a migrate source just to pull data from a Drupal 7 field table. Um, so you could just loop through every entry in, in every every entry in the field table and, and create something from it. Um, and I kind of think we should have more granular processing of DOM nodes, sort of a. Well, I am short on time, so I I, I can't really elaborate. Uh, there are a few references. You can't click on these um, unless you're following along with this link I gave you at the beginning. Um, we have done some work lately on the Migrate API documentation. Oh, whoops. That link seems to be broken. Um, the Migrate Plus module is where the most commonly used process plugins outside of Core are. Um, we've got change records for the Migrate Plus module describing the um, new process plugins that we add from time to time, XPath documentation. Uh, we have a documentation page on process pipelines. Uh, one of the examples that I started with is borrowed from there. And there are a couple of contrib modules for handling uh, media. So other questions, we do have five minutes, so I guess I left barely the, the, the minimum requested time. Questions? Is there anything you've wondered whether a migration could do and you just don't know if it's possible? You, you want to say something? Do you have a chance? Can you put the link up? Can you put the link to your slides back up? Yeah, sure. Uh, that's near the beginning. Let's follow along the slide. Welcome. Question? Um, if you're um, running a migration and you, you limit it, like um, I guess I'm running it through Drush, um, and maybe I only want to test it out and do a smaller amount of the migration, um, if, if you have multiple dependent migrations, that, does that, that runs into problems because maybe your first set of data was limited to 20 items, and then the next set doesn't refer to those 20. So it gets. I guess the question is: Is there a good approach for testing multiple, like nested migrations, without just running the whole thing? Yeah. So, so, so the question is: and I got to get into the recording. Uh, you you have a complicated site migration. Um, so 
some of your migrations depend on earlier ones, like when you're creating nodes, you need to have the author available, so you need already to have run the user migration. Um, is, is there a good way to, to test this incrementally and run just uh, 20 or 100 of the users instead of the 1,000 users you have on the site? Um, and the answer is um, there's no really reliable, simple way to do that. Um, I tend to run the full migration either locally or on a dev server. Um, if I really do have tens of thousands of users, um, I'll, the user migration is one of the first ones we run because lots of other things depend on it. Um, I will run it once. I will make a backup of the database where the migration has already been run. Um, and, and then I will restore from that database um, pretty frequently. And I, I guess I should back up and say that on a complex site migration, um, you're constantly tweaking it. You're constantly starting from scratch. Although when I say from scratch, it, it's open to an interpretation. And if, you're all, if you already decided that the user migration is done reliably, you can count that as part of starting from scratch. Um, so, so yeah, really one, one of the important things the Migrate API does for you, um, really one, one of its key features is that it does keep track of references um, from nodes to other nodes, from nodes to users, um, files and media. Um, and you're really not testing that unless you have run the full migration. So run your user migration, run your file migration. Those, those, those are pretty simple, not a lot of customization to be done there. Back up your database, and then from then on, starting from scratch means starting with those already done. Other questions? Thank you for listening, and uh, enjoy the rest of the time. Do we have one more session, or was this the last one? Oh, we just have the after party coming up. Okay, time to hit the big red button. <laughs>